Welcome everybody to Archive Dives with Oxen AI. This is a weekly series where we dive into interesting research papers in machine learning and AI and try to tease out the key insights so you can apply them to your own work. If you're new here, welcome. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We do this live every Friday over Zoom with the Oxen AI community, and we also post them to YouTube for anyone who isn't able to attend synchronously. This week, we're returning to a paper that we covered about a month ago that was called the self-reinforced self-reinforcing language model paper uh, from the team at meta ai uh, this time instead of going over the paper we're going to go over live working code so that we can dig into the nitty-gritty details of the implementation they didn't open source code we actually had a community member raul uh, volunteer himself to run all of the training scripts and write all of these files for you guys that you can run. Um, we call this version of Archive Dives the Practical ML Dive Series, and it's been a while since we've done one. But some quick background on us, Oxen AI is building a tool chain to help you collaborate and iterate on machine learning data sets like the ones used in these papers. In fact, for this paper, uh, we put all of the data sets in Oxen AI and as the model is training and self-reinforcing, we upload every single step, every single model checkpoint to an Oxen repository. So not only will you have the code, but you'll have the data and you'll have all the intermediate model checkpoints as, as we go through this. One of the key values of archive dives is that anybody can build it. We don't just want to read the research papers, but we also want to implement the ideas and apply them to our own work. So I'll be sharing this GitHub and let's dive in and see how a self-rewarding language model might work. So we went over the self-rewarding language model papers um, about a month ago. One of the community members, Raul, reached out if, and asked if he could help with any of the practical dives. So I said, absolutely, yes, uh, we could use the help. And we reproduced all of this on Google Colab. Um, Raul, how expensive did you say it was? It's probably like 20 to 30 bucks for everything. Yeah, about 30. And, and some, some uh, uh, I also run it on my machine as well, some inference. But uh, the cloud on Google, on Google Colab, it was about $30, uh, yeah. Great. Uh, and we went end to end going from uh, a seed model to a DPO trained uh, M1 model. And we'll walk through all of these steps, even if you haven't read the paper, hopefully all of this will click after you see each step running live. Um, but a quick refresher, uh, the self rewarding language model paper starts from a, a seed model um, that is just your basic non uh, your basic pre-trained large language model. So it hasn't been instruct tuned or, or anything like that. The first step is doing the instruct fine tuning and you'll get an M0 model. This model uh, is then used to take in a set of prompts, generate a set of responses for each prompt. And then you use the same model that generated the responses to also rank the responses and give each one a score. So you might have a prompt that's like, how do I make a birthday cake or something? And one response would be a really good recipe. And one response would be a really uh, non tasty recipe. And so you should the, the goal here is to have the same model be the reward model than than the one that's the instruct tuned model. So then once you have all the generated responses and all the generated rewards, you select the uh, the best and the worst pairs from your rewards for each prompt. You create a data set of preference pairs, and then you train the model with DPO or direct preference optimization to get a final M1 model that you can go back to the start of the loop. Uh, in this case, they generate new prompts, generate new responses, generate the rewards again. And in the paper, they did this loop three times and showed that the model improved 
each time uh, based on some evaluation from GPT-4. But that's kind of the high level loop. Um, we wrapped all of this into a single self-reward script uh, that takes in your scripts directory, oops, uh, base language model. And I just put the name of the model that you want to train here so that in theory, you could even put this in a loop and train M0, then train M1, um, and train M2. There's five scripts uh, that we put together here from the supervised fine tuning of the base model. Uh, this first step gives the model two capabilities. One is instruction following, and the other is evaluating its own responses. Um, then there's a script to generate new prompts uh, to add to the training set. There's a script to, given these new prompts, generate n responses, and then given the responses, score them all from one to five. Uh, once you have all the scores, turn them into preference pairs, and then finally run direct uh, preference optimization on the model. We're using Oxen AI in this process. If you're not familiar with Oxen, it helps you version and manage large data sets. Think of it like data that you wouldn't put on GitHub, large, uh, large language model training, computer vision data sets, all that kind of stuff. Um, and what's cool is we've even set up this self-rewarding language model repository with all the data so that we can kind of go through and see the results live as the model's training. Um, so I'll show you that real quick to give you a sense of where we're going with this. Um, we have this Slurm <laughs> repository that I kicked off last night. Uh, it's created this M0 um, folder for all of our data. You can see that the first model uploaded about six hours ago. Um, it's generating prompts and responses as we speak and uploading them here. So we can kind of like dive into what prompts are these things generating? What responses are they generating? Um, and then eventually get into ranking and scoring. But this thing is running live as, as we go through this and it'll be fun to dive into. So that said, let's go back into VS Code and start with the first step. So the first step is this supervised fine tuning step uh, where we give the model two capabilities, um, instruction following and evaluation. And so this is a pretty simple script um, that takes in a data set, a model, and a output directory um, for your, your trained model. Uh, all of the code is using Hugging Face um, Transformers library and this TRL SFT trainer class. Um, the models themselves are just auto models for casual language modeling. Um, and instead of doing a full fine tuning, we're creating the um, the LoRa style models so that you can do parameter efficient fine tuning in PEFT. Um, if you're not familiar with LoRa, we have a dive on that as well. But in this case, we're fine tuning many of the linear layers within the model. So the Q, K, B, and O layers, as well as the Mistral model itself has this gating mechanism at the end. Um, and so this first script here uh, is all set up for you and takes takes in a what's called an IFT data set to start. Um, so if we want to look at what IFT data looks like and um, what the starting point for this whole loop is. IFT stands for instruction fine tuning. Um, so we have this training directory and we have an IFT data set. So this is basically a bunch of prompts and a bunch of completions 
everything from why is Aristotelian view of physics wrong? And then it just has the completion here. And there's about 31 uh, hundred rows in this data set. So it's actually not that large. It was scraped from the open assistant two data set that had uh, a bunch of data in a bunch of different languages. And we filtered it down to just the prompts in English, as well as the highest ranked prompts um, from the community that labeled that data. Um, but a pretty, pretty reasonable size data set to get up and running. Um, and so the first step in this whole pipeline is, and I guess I can even share the GitHub here to make it and, easier. Hey Greg, while you're switching back over, Kaiser had a question saying uh, that the R and alpha seemed a little high. Is that from the self-reward paper? Because uh, he thinks that the original Laura was four for both R and alpha. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so if we look at the model itself, um, Raul, I know you picked these from a example of yeah. fine tuning in Mistral. Yeah, so uh, it, the, the values are not from that paper. Uh, there are several blog entries that I found uh, where they did tuning on Mistral and they have all different values. And somebody ran some experiments. And um, if I remember correctly, I think this is exactly the factor that, that he saw between uh, alpha and R. So and uh, like four. So he, he said that basically they did it with uh, uh, a couple of, of uh, values, uh, each of them having this uh, ratio of four. And um, this is what, what I used in, uh, in the training. This is what and also it was used in most of the of the other uh, tutorials. Totally. And if I recall, when we grabbed the the numbers from the paper itself, we had a hard time training the initial model, right? Yeah, yeah. The the loss just didn't uh, uh, go down. It stayed yeah. uh, for a couple of hundred of steps, almost the same. Yeah, and so one of the big differences um, between this implementation and the one in the paper is the size of the model. So I'm curious if that had anything to do with it. Yeah, so it's not just a base model, but also the fact that this is uh, using quantization. So uh, it, when we load, we have this uh, um, quantization config when we load the model on line 25. Yeah. And this yep. is 4-bit quantization, and it behaves uh, a bit differently than if you just do uh the fine tuning on a normal model yep so some parameters to tweak there we found that these worked the best but uh great question there cool um so that's the first step is doing the supervised fine tuning um the first supervised fine tuning is just on this ift data set uh to take the base Mistral model. Um, they do have some instruct fine tuning ones. We wanted to start from the base one, train that to follow instructions um, to give you that seed model. Um, so if you're if you're follow, following along with the paper, it's the seed model that comes in right here in this step. Um, and so that's just one that's trained uh, just to follow instructions. The next step is to add a another capability to the model, which they call the evaluation fine tuning data. So the EFT data set itself looks like not only uh, the instructions and responses, but a LLM as a judge prompt as well. Um, so that looks like this, um, where we prompt the LLM to look at the user's question and look at the response that comes out of the model and score it from zero to five. And it also adds a bunch of criterion within the prompt um, to add one point if the response is relevant, uh, another point if it addresses a substantial portion of the user's question, et cetera. So this is the prompt from the paper um, 
And this is an interesting area that I feel could be tweaked in future iterations. Uh, some people call this constitutional AI where you're kind of giving it like um, constitutions that it has to live by. And this is this is kind of the secret sauce of the reinforcement loop itself um, because we're not just taking every single value or every single prompt and response that comes out in this loop. Um, but this step of the reward model filters down the pairs of data that we're going to feed back into the model. Um, so it's really important that you get the model to not only generate coherent responses, but rank those responses and be able to catch itself if it's generating data that um, that is not that we don't want to put back into the training data set. Um, so the next step is generating the prompts themselves to add to the training data set. Um, so what we do here is, uh, in this case, we take in a base model, um, a training data file, and then we're going to be outputting a prompts file. And uh, Raul, this is one step that I tweaked um, after we looked at it. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, in the paper, they use an eight-shot prompt uh, to generate new prompts. So what this looks like is come up with a series of tasks and questions, only the task in question, no further text or, or explanation, no additional information. And the task or question should be something that a person would ask a chatbot. And so what we do is from this train.jsonl, which is the same as that instruction fine tune, we sample eight of the prompts and just append that to the end here. And then we ask the model just to continually generate new tasks. Um, so this is actually a pretty fun step to watch live. So let's go back to VS Code and see how this all works. Um, so I'm going to run scripts, and we want to do generate the prompts. Um, this one takes in a base model name. Um, so in this case, we're just going to be using the Mistral base model. And what you kind of want here is a model that is not instruct tuned, um, because it's much better at just like repeating itself, which is a quality that you don't necessarily always want, but is really, uh, really good for this type of use case. And then we're going to point it to our M0 um, train ift.json, and then we're going to output that data. Let's just do it to like temp props uh, .json L. So this is going to load the Mistral 7B model that takes the longest. I'm running this on a A10 GPU in Lambda Labs. Um, but you can see it creates that eight shot prompt that we just talked about, um, where it lists eight random tasks from the existing training data set. And then it starts to complete a bunch of new questions here. Um, and it just like continually runs until we get a thousand new prompts. You'll notice it does tend to repeat itself sometimes, like this one right here. Uh, so this script is also deduplicating everything that comes out. Um, so sometimes you get lucky and you get like a full set of new prompts. And sometimes you just get like one new prompt because it <laughs> starts repeating itself over and over again. Um, but pretty impressed at the variety of prompts that came out of this step. Um, and Raul, when I changed it to be like, kind of like this XML style of task and end task, that made it a much easier to parse um, out at the end. Yeah, yeah. So that's that one. Um, we generated a thousand of those in this step uh, and uploaded them to Oxen. So let's kind of take a look. It'll be easier to dive in without watching it scroll by at endless 
pace. Um, so that was in this Slurm one uh, generated prompts. Um, so could you write completely serious, non-suggestive police report based off this joke? Some of these prompts are like continuations from a full chat conversation. So that's an interesting um, attribute of the data set that we started with. Um, but it does have some pretty high quality synthetic data here, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and you can pan through, there's a thousand and eight that we generated here, but pretty encouraging first step in the whole pipeline. So then the next step, once we have all of those props generated, is to take the generated prompts and create n responses per prompt um, from the supervised fine-tuned model that we created in the first step. Uh, Raul did all the heavy lifting of training this initial model. So we can just grab that from Hugging Face. Um, let me see if I have the, the link here as well. Raul, the first one was Mistral 7B IFT3. Is that correct? Yeah, IFT minus three. So if you go to Hugging Face, we uploaded, yeah. or Raul uploaded them all to his namespace here. Um, there's a few experiments that we did. Um, but do you want to talk about this one at all? The, yeah, the difference between the IFT2 and 3 is the learning rate and the, um, the layers in, in the model that uh, I applied LoRa config to. Yep. And uh, uh, because the first one um, was only applying it to three layers which is the three layers so basically the original paper um used just these three layers uh, as an example they they said there in the paper it could be applied to more but they they use only these three and then um i tried it with a couple more so i find in a, in a couple of uh, blog entries that people suggested to use this uh, gate um and output uh, layer. So this is why I included these two. And I also uh, reduced the learning rate because the um, one from the paper, from, from the self reward paper uh, also did not uh, converge. It was not learning. Great. So yeah, we found that this one worked a bit better. Um, so this is the one that we kicked off the rest of the scripts with. Um, and so, like I said, the, the next step is generating the responses um, from that prompts file that we just created uh, and writing them all to a responses file. This step takes the longest in the pipeline. Would you say, Raul, this was like <laughs> the most painful part? Yeah, so it took like uh, almost 10 seconds per response. And yep. here we generate four responses for each uh, uh, for each prompt. So in the end, it, there were four thousand. So even in the in in the cloud with a A one hundred GPU, it still took like almost ten uh, seconds for for response. So in the, I ended up running it on my machine for like almost twelve hours or something like that. Yep. Um, yeah. And so you can see as we kick it off, it's like processing prompt one and generating completion one. Um, so prompt one in this case was actually, that is all for now, great job. <laughs> completion one, it, uh, I guess is like, thank you. And then he, or the model starts repeating itself a lot, um, but then it's prompt one, completion two. Um, so completion two is gonna be different than completion one here. Um, and so, you can kind of see, like Raul said, this takes about 10 seconds for each completion. And if we're doing four by a thousand, um, you can see why this is one of the most compute intensive steps in the whole pipeline, which is interesting because I feel like 
you know, traditional machine learning, you kind of always think the training step is the most intensive, but this SFT pipeline took about three to four hours, depending on what GPU you're using. Um, but generating the data within here was the most expensive part. Um, here's a more realistic prompt and response. How do I get rid of a rash on my face? Um, and then it's generating a bunch of instructions there. Um, um, is there any dependency on each of these generations? Like, is, it does completion two depend on completion one, for instance? Nope. Uh, they're all independent. Okay. In the paper, I mean, it looks like everything's batched here. So you do all of step zero before all of step two before all of step three. It seemed like in the paper, they were kind of doing it like one at a time. Is that just like a limitation of the script or? Um, what do you mean one at a time? In which like step? It, it, it seems like we're doing one stage of this pipeline at a time. Like we're doing like one batch of training examples and then we run zero, one, two, three, four, five. Whereas yep. for, I remember from when we read this paper, it seemed like they were kind of doing this in a uh, continuous loop. Uh. Yeah, but each step within the loop is discontinuous. Um, so it's oh, not like it's not like the this is like a network that propagates everything back through. It's like this is one state of the model. They generate a bunch yeah. of responses and then they, they train. So, so are you saying like after we run script five, we would go back and run script one again or script yep. zero? Yep. Exactly. Okay. Good question. Um Cool. So then, where are we? And yeah, I batched all of these into like the self reward.sh if you want to run them back to back. But I see. That's cool. Yeah, I was just I was asking about the the dependencies because, you know, if one of the steps takes eight times as much compute as all the others, but there are no dependencies between each of the steps that it has to do, then you could kind of like fan out for a second. Yes. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Totally. Um, that's what made, that's what I thought of in this step in particular. Um, like I could totally see using a service like modal or something like that, um, and spinning up a <laughs> hundred a tens. Have you guys heard of modal.com? Um, it's like a serverless compute platform. Uh, what we should get the get server to use to do, do a fan out. Yeah, totally. You could use that for your project too. Um, so then that's great. Uh, I actually don't know where my terminal went for <laughs> this existing, uh, run. Oh, there it is. And so, yeah, as we've been talking, it's gotten through about 16 of these completions. Um, so not that much, but enough for us to go to the next step at least. Uh, so the next step is generating the scores for each response. Um, so we can take the same model um, that we've trained to both follow instructions and judge itself um, and run the third one, which is going to be generating scores. Um, this one takes in your model, the responses file that we just generated and will generate scores for each one. Um, so this one's responses, scores, oops, which doesn't exist yet. Um, and I think we saved out about 16 before. So this one, I think we can run to completion and see some of the results, but. While this one kind of cooks up, we, oh, well, we'll see. But uh, there were two questions in the chat. The first probably easier was around the like system configuration and resources for the machines that this was run on. Um, anything on that? Yeah. So, so oh yeah, go ahead, Raul. You can answer. All so, that. so I, I wanted to say for training, I used Colab with uh, a 100 GPU server, which has uh, 50, um, gigabyte and it used about 25, um, for, for training. I tried to do training on my machine but uh, it would not it would just not work um, i have on my machine only 16 
and um, even with different parameters uh, for uh, lower end quantizations and batch and so on, it it uh, eventually started working, but it would have taken like 20 hours or something like that. Um, as for um, generating the prompts, uh, I did that on my machine because I didn't notice any big difference between running it on in Colab on, on my machine. And as I said, my, my machine has 16 uh, gigabyte. Um, as for RAM, um, it actually started using RAM as well at one point, and it, it went up to like 20 gigabyte usage. Yeah. But it's uh, in the end, it's a, I'd say it's a normal consumer configuration. It's not, not nothing big or parallel GPUs and some anything cool. like that. Ro, what was the cost of the collab um, of the hours that you bought? Um, about thirty dollars. Oh wow! I did I I did run some tests and some some trainings. I stopped and tried to start them again and so. <laughs> so if if you like, don't change any parameter. I guess this would go down to like twenty twenty five. Yeah, I'm saying wow, and that that that's low. Yeah, exactly. It was like a hundred and. $106. I tell Evan he owes me $106.25 for all that training. Uh, <laughs> but, and then it didn't even finish. It but yeah. Did this is only one generation. So um oh. as Greg said, they did, did three generations in their um uh paper, but I did only one end to end. Yeah. Gotcha. So the whole thing, you know, might be a hundred dollars for for all three, but super reasonable Which for still is. Good. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, okay. And then the machine that I'm running it on is a A10 uh, with 24 GB, and you can see like the inference step uh, only takes about half of that for these seven billion models. A good back of the envelope trip trick is just to double the number, and that's about how many gigabytes you're going to be using. So this is a seven billion model. It's using about 14 gigs of VRAM. Um, so now we're going through and generating the scores for each one. It did all 16. Um, and you can see, given the LLM as a judge prompt, which I didn't have downloaded before, um, but it's that same one that we looked at in the UI. Um, and you can see the question right here. So change the general theme of the song lyrics to something more happy. Again, this is a continuation of an existing one, but it's interesting. This model still generates some song lyrics here. Um, and then once it finishes the LLM as a judge prompt, it scored this one three. Um, and then it even gave some reasoning behind its score. Um, so we went and parse out all of those scores um, and put them into this prompts or the scores file itself. So if we look at that one, um, it is all the prompts, all the completions, the scores, and then I put the reasoning here. Um, Raul, I, I changed this a little to parse it out and, and put it there so we could do some debugging. But um, this is 16 of the scores from the 16 that we just generated. And you can see each one has a prompt ID and it kind of repeats itself four times. Um, and then we have four different scores that came out of this. So for this prompt completion pairs, the next step is going to look at all of the generations and take the highest score and the lowest score and make a preference pair out of it. So that one's this gen prep pairs script. Um, so scripts zero four gen prep pairs. Um, that one takes in the scores dot JSON L that we just generated. Uh, which I might not have saved actually. Scores. Oh, there it is. JSON L and uh, preferences. And if we look at that data frame, um, now we have a format that's like prompt, chosen, and rejected. Um, so the chosen 
one will be the one with the highest score. The rejected one will be the one with the lowest score. Um, and so you can see that five and two here as the highest and lowest. Um, so this step in general, I know Raul, you did a little more filtering than I did here. Do you want to talk about how much data we extracted when it was like going from those 4,000 completions to this preference data set? Yeah, so the 4,000 completions were for the 1,000 uh, prompts that we saw earlier. And um, in the paper, they noticed that uh, the score was, for a lot of the entries, was four. And uh, strangely or funny enough, we saw the same. So um, a lot of, of the of the scores were, were four, and I eliminated all of the entries, so all of the prompts where... Um, all four scores had the four, score four. So in the end, we had instead of the thousand prompts, something like five five hundred and eighty in in my tests. Yep. And in the paper itself, um, they said for the M one model, they added like another three thousand thousand. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember the number thousand or something? I think three thousand or so. Yeah. And then for the next step, they added like 6,000. So seems like they were probably generating more prompts yeah. than us. Three, so that they three nine, prompt. and six, nine. Yep. Um, so given compute resources, we only did those thousand prompts in this gen prompt step, but uh, you could imagine doing more so that the filtering step has more data that you could feed into DPO. Um, but then the final step in this whole prop in this whole pipeline is taking the prompt chosen uh, rejected data, feeding that through DPO um, and giving it the model that you just uh, that you trained in the first step. Um, and so we could actually probably run this one to completion because our DPO training data set is only four examples. Um, I don't know if the batching is going to work for this, but let's do it. Why not? Uh, what is, I'll take this guy. Go. References. And we'll just write it to M. I guess this would be M1. Generate training script from our four examples. What's the model? I think our batch size is four, isn't it, Roll? So this will just do one. <laughs> one yeah. one yeah, step. Yeah. Two check questions uh, while we're hanging out. First, Paul asked if the long responses happen even after, you know, even for the instruct fine tuned and evaluate fine tuned model. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Raul, do you want to answer it? Yeah, yeah. So they happened. Um, and I wanted to experiment a bit with um, AOS um, or separators, but I couldn't, I didn't have time to look into that. But it did happen also after the. Uh, instruct and evaluate fine tuning. So, oh, yeah. sorry, uh, just to ch uh, chime in. Is that um, what's it called? So, in there, in the sorry, in the prompt that they use to generate the evaluations, is that like part of it, like giving a long response? Does it say something about that there? It does not. Um, or could it be modified to give a shorter I, response there? Maybe I don't know. Maybe it will, would not work as well, perhaps. So. I don't know. Well, I added here uh, somewhere below the the text to output the score of the evaluations in this exact format score and so on, because it would give different output, like one out of five or sometimes even float numbers. Mm -hmm. So this is one change that I did. And then obviously the total points should be between zero and five. Um, okay. But Up to 100 even, words, I see. Okay. 
yeah and even but even in the in the if or on generating the prompts sometimes it would uh, like we just saw it would just go on and on so i guess with more data and probably other configurations um of the tokenizer it would be better but in these tests were like, it's like this and especially for these smaller models i feel like Small, yeah. yeah they do tend to repeat themselves more so we were talking about how it could be interesting even to have uh one more human in the loop step to like mark all of those and have that be another capability of the model just to say like hey if you see something like that score it zero every time um and adding that to the training data itself for the dpo step could be interesting um but i think it is just a fact that not using the the biggest models here gotcha yeah that makes sense thanks um cool so then that's kind of the the five steps there uh the cool part about this loop and i kicked it off last night um you can see it's still running here um and it's done 134 prompts and it's on the first completion of of this one um but in the self to reward script um I go ahead and run each one of the steps and then upload the final checkpoints or any like generated data in the meantime to Oxen so that you can kind of not just look at it in the terminal, um, but look at it in the UI as well. So the, the generated responses, generated scores, um, preference pairs, et cetera. Um, and that is running and going to that one Oxen repo that I can link you guys to, um, but I'll continually run it over the weekend um, and just wanted to make sure all of this was reproducible end to end um, from all of the scripts that Raul generated. So round of applause for him. This was a super fun one to like see how it works in person um, or in practice. And yeah, Evan, you have another question? Yeah, so I just realized like, um... When you're generating those prompt completion, like those prompts, could you keep sharing your screen? I, I uh, wanted to point something out. Yeah. Um, it looks like you were doing it like one at a time, and I'm wondering, like, I'm wondering if that's like a limitation of the Hugging Face library. So it's like no. a really long step. And was, you can uh, batch these. Um, okay. It was it was more of a debugging and just like getting this working kind of thing. Um, but you could gotcha. pass in um a batch of prompts to the tokenizer okay. and then gotcha yeah all right that answers my question thanks yeah.